Whoever you may be, wherever you may live, this program contains material and information that is vitally important to you and your future. It is sensitive information that until now has been kept secret. Since the dawn of time, there is one field in which man has always excelled, the destruction of his fellow human beings. He told Dr. Russell <clears throat> that he should take this information and lock it up. And in a thousand years, this should be released. He said the people of the earth are not ready for this information. It has been so long uh, since the need for the experiment to be kept secret uh, has been uh, that I think the time has come uh, to, uh, to use the possibilities of such a secret, not for military use at the present time, uh, but uh, for the use of science and for the use of knowledge. It, it not only disrupted radio, but it did other things. It burned all of our wiring into in the plane. It would blow fluorescent lights completely off the wall that might be two floors away. The crew had not been psychologically prepared uh, for what would happen to them, and uh, 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 they ended up very badly. Some of them, uh, it is, has been more, uh, has been fairly well established, died as a result. Others uh, spent years, according to their own statements, in Navy hospitals. The NSA's argument was of such substance as to not require release of the documents because of the possible effect on the national security. Now, if that isn't cover-up, then what is it? Here we have an agency of the U.S. government saying we've got 131 documents about UFOs. We will not release them to anyone, including the judge, because of the sensitive nature of the materials involved. Best case can definitely be made against CIA. Definitely. Uh, the CIA has refused time and again to surrender information which the Air Force acknowledges they received, uh, Army acknowledged they received, FBI would have acknowledged they received, uh, things typically routed through National Military Command Center. Or we've gone for main engine start. A thing that we need now is we need a breakthrough in a new concept in propulsion. That when we talk about chemical propulsion, We've stretched it just about as far as we can. What we need is an anti-gravitational device or something like that. And Do you think that is possible? Who knows? Anything in the, in the future is possible. We even got a patent later on. I got a patent on, uh, on a magnetohydrodynamic device that was very similar to the flying saucer. In fact, it was developed from a combination of all of the ideas of the flying saucer. In the name of the twelve colonies of man, I demand the release of the humans. Yes, go saucers, laser guns, secret experiments in travel through time and space. Are all these things pure fiction imagined in the minds of science fiction writers? Or are they glimpses into the future of planet Earth and the coming technology? Are the people of Earth being conditioned to accept a new world? These questions were the reason for a worldwide search for the truth. A search led by Stan Deo, an inventor and computer technologist from Dallas, Texas, who at one time was an officer cadet at the United States Air Force Academy and an informant for the FBI. This is his story to uncover the cosmic conspiracy. United States Air Force Academy. 
This is where it all began for me. It's just a few miles from the headquarters of the North American Air Defense Command, NORAD, buried deep below Cheyenne Mountain. How quickly the 20 years have gone by since my conditioning was completed. 186 of us have been programmed by post-hypnotic suggestion and subliminal training. But what training, what information had been so sensitive, so secret that even we, the trainees, could not be trusted with the conscious knowledge? Years had passed before I realized that the rebellious instructor who had reprogrammed my mind just before I left the academy had allowed me to eventually remember things that had been locked away in my subconscious, things that could affect the future path of mankind. I wondered how much of that information was connected with other experiments that had previously been carried out in Colorado. I'm sure most of you recognize this. It's light. And I'm also equally sure that most of you recognize this. It's the wire that brings the electricity up to this light to make it work. But how many of you know the name of the man that invented the system that makes this electricity? His name was Dr. Nikola Tesla, perhaps one of the most brilliant scientists of the last two centuries. Tesla was a Yugoslav, born in Croatia of Serbian parents in 1857. For over 50 years before his death in 1943, he was a citizen of the United States. Tesla set up a laboratory at Colorado Springs where he could study the fantastic displays of one of Mother Nature's most awesome powers, lightning. Finally, he emulated nature itself by creating man-made lightning. This genius not only invented alternating current electricity, but also the electric induction motor, the basis of all electric motors today. He transmitted power through the earth, enough to light 10,000 watts of filament globes at a distance of over 25 miles. His work led to the world's first hydroelectric power station at Niagara Falls. At a spectacular and unbelievable demonstration in Madison Square Gardens in 1898, Tesla caused a sensation with the successful operation of the world's first ever remote control device. It was the time of the Spanish-American War, but Tesla's astonishing robotic submarine grabbed front page headlines. If this submarine were loaded with dynamite, the Americans would have had an awesome new weapon. In Tesla's words, a race of robots. The press and the public of the time could see the potential of this new device, even though the U.S. government could not. But his greatest dream was to construct a tower on Long Island, New York. The purpose of this tower was to transmit pure electrical energy, without wires, around the world. With this form of energy, he foresaw many great things. In this book of 1919 is an article by Nikola Tesla entitled My Inventions. And in this article, he talks about things to come using his broadcast power without wires, based upon his proposed project at Long Island. I'll read you his words. The new self-propelled aerial teleautomaton, devoid of propeller, sustaining wings, and all other means of external control. It can attain a speed of 350 miles an hour, and that was fast in those days and will reach a predetermined point a thousand miles away accurately within a few feet. What I found most astounding about this article was the artist's impression of Tesla's electric flying machine, a cigar-shaped object surrounded by an ionized air glow. This reminded me of the many reports of UFOs that glowed. Was Tesla 80 years ago working on the same principle that flying saucers use? If so, what happened to his research papers on the matter? And why was the almost completed power tower on Long Island blown up by the authorities during World War I? The Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York, the largest edifice of Christian worship in the world. It was here on January the 15th, 1943, that more than 1,000 distinguished citizens from around the world gathered to pay their last respects to one of the greatest scientists in recorded history. This greatness gave us the first radio broadcast in 1896 over a distance of 25 miles, two years before Marconi, who was credited with the invention of radio. He gave the world a system of electric power, which 80 years later has not been surpassed. He invented and patented over 900 different electrical concepts and devices. 
Are these ashes all that remain of this man, who even made it possible to bring down lightning from the heavens in the sight of man anywhere on the globe? Charlotte Musar, a close friend during his later years, was one of the mourners at Tesla's funeral. She had worked as an employee at the Yugoslav embassy. She recalled the mysterious circumstances surrounding the investigation of Tesla's papers after his death. When I arrived, I found the safe was open. I don't know who ordered the opening of the safe. I learned uh, later that uh, all the government officials and the police and the coroner and so forth, medical examiner, had been there and gone. Ms. Musar explained to me that the Edison gold medal Tesla had been awarded in 1917 had been locked in a drawer inside the safe along with the keys to that drawer. The knob twirled and the safe was locked. Ms. Musar had been trusted with the combination of the safe until it was reopened in Belgrade some years later. The first thing we did is to open the safe. That's when I had to pull out the combination, gave it to Mr. Kasanovich who opened the safe and uh, we looked for the keys. We couldn't open the compartment and everything else. Nowhere in the safe could we find the keys. We found them in a completely unrelated, unattached box among the many that were there, finally. And when we did open this compartment, no metal was found. So that assured us that uh, when the fellows at the warehouse told Mr. Cassani some guys were here, well, FBI guys were here one night taking pictures of everything. That's how they described it to him. So then that uh, we knew then that someone had gone through his papers. But who, when, and where exactly, we don't know. Dr. John Trump, the founder of High Voltage Engineering in Boston, Massachusetts, was called in at the time of Tesla's death to inspect his papers. Dr. Trump was one of the few people in America who could read and understand the advanced work that Tesla had been engaged in. But Dr. Trump had been instructed to search for something in particular. But I was particularly looking for something which would uh, just be evidence of a secret weapon, which I was reminded by the agents, the two agents who were present during the entire time uh, was uh, a matter of concern to the United States. Tesla had written to the King of England and to the Tsar of Russia, offering a secret weapon. Both these countries at the time were involved in all-out war against Germany. Dr. Trump recalled the supposed properties of that weapon. It had the capability of acting at a great distance, of being destructive, to flying objects and things of that kind at a place which was remote from the source. This is the safe of Nikola Tesla. It once contained his most prized possessions, his most secret papers. Miss Musar had arrived too late to know who had opened Dr. Tesla's safe or what had been removed. And Dr. Trump had found nothing which he considered dangerous or a secret weapon. Tesla had been a naturalized American citizen for 54 years. So why were his papers seized by agents of the custodian of alien property? I suspect that governments other than those of the United States, England, and Russia were interested in the inventions of Dr. Tesla. In 1943, the year of Tesla's death was destined to become a year of the most imaginative scientific experiments in the history of the world. while England was reeling under the impact of guided missile bombardment from German-controlled Europe, America was involved in one of the most amazing and fantastic experiments ever devised by man. Codenamed Project Rainbow, the objective was to place two massive toroidal electromagnets around the hull of a ship to make it disappear. The only thorough investigation of this highly classified and bizarre experiment has been carried out by Charles Berlitz and William Moore, co-authors of the Philadelphia Experiment. They had two enormous degaussers uh, that uh, 
uh, that established the field of resonance, which initially, as I said, was to make clouds of ionization around the ship and make it invisible, as well as invisible to radar. But what happened was much more uh, surprising and unsettling than that. Uh, the ship uh, seemed to glow in the field, and all of a sudden, with a sort of, uh, the, the, uh, the way you put on uh, a, a neon light, except in reverse, it flicked off instead of flicking on and there was no ship there. I believe the experiment was done once more at sea, and it was the fact that the experiment was done at sea under better conditions that it became more or less public knowledge because the disappearing uh, destroyer was seen uh, by a ship in convoy to disappear at only at 100 yards away. A group of scientists had been working towards these experiments for some time. They were headed by Dr. Albert Einstein and included an American electrical physicist. Thomas Townsend Brown, and he was not to my knowledge a doctor, um, and is still alive by the way, uh, <clears throat> is perhaps a very typical example of an individual who devoted the best part of his life to trying to understand and develop technology that the rest of the world didn't seem quite ready to accept. Townsend Brown, who had a, a military background, was a lieutenant commander in World War II. <clears throat> had a nervous breakdown in 1943. We know he was uh, very depressed over the effect on the crew members of the, of the experiment and the subsequent experiment which took place at sea. Suddenly a nervous breakdown, everything else. It's common knowledge in any government that people who have a history of nervous breakdowns are security risks. They're not given classifications. There are indications that this work went on, in spite of Townsend Brown, under top secret government projects. I think they're far in advance of his research today. Brown's research had included Project Winterhaven, experiments in interdimensional travel, similar to the Philadelphia experiment. He had worked for the French government on moving structures using only electrical power. And in 1957, he began to work in North Carolina with Agnew H. Bonson and James Frank King, on electric flying craft. Agnew Bonson was killed in a plane crash in 1964, but I found King alive and well in North Carolina. This was the early 50s when everybody was awfully interested in flying saucers anyway. And most of the people were trying to find some reason for their being here. Also, other people were trying to find how they could have, they could fly and they could do the things that people said that they could do. And so we wanted to go further. We wanted to do mechanical and electrical work to try to find uh, a power source that was similar to what they might have been using. We needed somebody that had done more along the lines that we believed in. And we hunted for various people. Finally decided that uh, T. Townsend Brown, that we had read about but had never met, was working along lines that we liked. Um, so we needed Brown, so we began to hunt for him, and this was in 1957. So Brown worked with Bonson and King, successfully building and testing flying saucers, but they did have some problems. We made saucers that were as large as seven feet in diameter, and we ran those all the way up to a million volts. And they would fly, we flew those, but they could only fly within the limits of the umbilical cord that, were, that was carrying the high voltage to them. So Brown, Bonson, and King had realized one of the dreams of Nikola Tesla. They had created a noiseless flying craft without wings, without rudders, and without propellers. But it had to be tethered to its power source by a cable. Tesla's greatest dream was to surround the Earth with electricity, pumped into the upper atmosphere by his power tower on Long Island. This would enable the user to draw electric power anywhere on the globe from his system. Was this all that was needed to make the electric flying craft practical? J. Frank King applied for a patent on their magneto-hydrodynamic propulsion system in 1962. The U.S. government, however, held back the granting of that patent for five years. I asked him why. The uh, patent office understands, each patent examiner understands that any device that could in any way affect the national security would have to go into a special section of the patent office. 
And so certain types of patents, certain flying machines, weapons of different types, all go into this special part of the patent office and they won't release it to the public. In fact, they, they even send people around saying, uh, we'll do bad things to you if you talk about it until we release it. And uh, they finally did release it in 1967. In the meantime, as far as I know, there were no government tests or anything else run on it. I've never read any reports that have been written by researchers, government researchers on it. But I imagine there must have been some report written on it to have released it. Date number 1310990, lodged on 11 December 1970 by British Railways, detailed the technical data required to build a space vehicle powered by fusion energy. The space vehicle is circular in shape, and the primary source of particle emission is an array of lasers. However, in the middle of 1982, it was announced that the program had been abandoned. My real-world job, if you want to put it that way, is in the space shuttle program. I'm project manager for space flight operations for the McDonnell Douglas Corporation. And you are um, you're stationed at the... I'm stationed at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, in Houston Texas. Mr. John Schusler is also deputy director of a worldwide organization known as MUFON. Yes, the Mutual UFO Network is an international research and investigative organization dedicated to the study of the UFO phenomenon. And it's international because the scope of this problem is international. UFOs are seen everywhere and they're poorly investigated in so many areas. And MUFON was put together by a group of specialists that really wanted to do more than just look at lights in the sky or, or chase the, uh, the silly world of UFOs. We wanted to do something realistic about it. We feel there's pay dirt uh, in the study of the UFO phenomenon. Whether it be psychological or an engineering problem, it's still going to be worthwhile. So we have uh, consultants the world over, as well as investigators and just subscribers that uh, contribute on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Mr. Schusler and the Mutual UFO Network seem to be the only credible organization in the world today carrying out an objective, scientific investigation of the UFO phenomenon, even in advance of government research. I say they seem to be, but I don't believe so. In the mid-1970s, a group known as Ground Saucer Watch filed a lawsuit against the Central Intelligence Agency. This was done under the Freedom of Information Act. This lawsuit was carried on by a group calling itself Citizens Against UFO Secrecy, or CAUSE. Finally, in 1978, as a result of this lawsuit, 900 pages of information relating to the CIA investigation of UFOs were released. These 900 sheets are supposed to be all the available information the CIA had on UFO investigation up to 1978. In December 78, when the CIA released about 900 sheets of paper, of which these are some, uh, I went through them with a fine-tooth comb. There were lots of duplicates. For example, if Mr. X in the CIA had written a memo in 1952 to his associates, Mr. Y and Mr. Z, and maybe Y had made some notes on the margin, when the CIA purged their, their UFO files and released copies, they would release a copy of X's memo plus the copy of that memo that went to Y plus the one that went to Z. So there were a lot of duplicates. Philip Klass is the senior electronics editor for Aviation Week and Space Technology. Out of those 900 pages, there were about 200, 250 sheets over a 30-year, 30 33-year period and that had something of value. At least I felt it did. That means that on average, the CIA, the entire agency, wrote about 8 to 10 sheets of paper per year on the subject of UFOs. I venture to say that if we could get the CIA to purge and release documents on hiring prostitutes for visiting foreign dignitaries, there would be 10 times as many sheets. Eight to 10 sheets per year from the entire resources of the Central Intelligence Agency. Obviously, all available information was not released. Stephen Stoics, administrator of CAUSE, explained why. Basically, what these government agencies will do, what the CIA will do, is ask for every available specific on a document if you don't know the precise date time group 
if you don't know the precise originating agency, if you don't know very exact details of the incident, they won't acknowledge its existence. If you're one day off on the time group, there is a very carefully worded response stating, we know of no such incident on day in question. They don't respond to blanket questions because they don't have to. has a background in liberal arts, history, teaching, and English. He also speaks fluent French, holds a degree in Russian, and is co-author of the Philadelphia Experiment. Stanton T. Friedman holds bachelor's and master's degrees in physics and spent 14 years working on classified government programs in high-power electric propulsion. Since 1970, they've been lecturing in schools and colleges across the United States and Canada on the presence of alien craft around planet Earth. I'd arranged to meet them in the small Arizona town of Prescott, where they'd been invited to deliver their lecture at the Yavapai College. We have been told that the Air Force was the chief agency involved in the investigation of UFOs. We have been told about Project Grudge, Project Sign, Project Blue Book. And we have been told that these are essentially the only efforts by the Air Force to investigate the phenomenon of UFOs. And that Project Blue Book was closed in 1969, and that its records in 1975 were transferred to the National Archives. And so if you write a letter of inquiry to the government, any agency of the government, you invariably will get the same answer. The government's files on UFOs were transferred to the National Archives, Project Blue Book. Um, material is totally available and it can be viewed or obtained from the National Archives. There's only one thing wrong with that statement, and that is that it is not true. And it becomes increasingly clear that they have known a great deal and that they have been keeping it from the American public for reasons known to the government. I had arranged for Stan and Bill to meet me in my motel room the next day. Primarily, I wanted to question them further on the cover-up of UFO investigation and to see if they had any more information on government projects such as the Philadelphia Experiment or electric flying craft. I wasn't really prepared for what they told me. I um, am convinced, after 24 years now of studying investigation, that the evidence is overwhelming that planet Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled extraterrestrial vehicles. Some UFOs are somebody else's spacecraft. I'm also convinced that some small group in the government of the United States, and probably in other countries as well, knows very well that we're dealing with alien spacecraft. We're dealing with what in the States is appropriately called a cosmic water game. We're not convinced that everything should be put on the table. Technical data, for example, I'm not at all sure should be out on the table because the key feature about flying saucers, forgetting philosophy, religion, and all those other areas which are certainly important, has to be how do they work. Every government in the world would like to get its mitts on that kind of technology. Unfortunately, what that would mean, better weapons delivery and defense systems, I suppose. But, and so I don't think that data should be put on the table unless everybody puts all their data out on the table. And we both feel that it's very, very important for the future of the race to recognize at some point in our sociological development that we are planetary creatures. That is, members of a planetary society, as opposed to nationalistic creatures, members of individual, in this case, 158 now different tribes, essentially countries, on the same planet. Uh, I think that, <clears throat> that once that realization is made, that we begin to think of ourselves as members of the human race on planet Earth. The thing about governments, though, most governments, is that priority number one is to stay in power whether they're electric, uh, elected governments or despotic governments. Yes. Staying in power is the key. And I think in the United States, for example, any president that stands up and says, look, we've been lying to you for 35 years. We have had positive proof of their existence. We can't reveal the technical data, but we've known it. We've had our reasons. Is going to immediately be accused of being a liar, uh, quite straightforwardly, is in danger of losing the next election, is risking his political skin, so to speak. In the United States, that could be done by a president who had been elected twice in a row because you can't run for a third term now. We haven't had such a president since uh, General Eisenhower. Frequently, the, uh, the question most asked, 
why, if they are coming here, haven't they chosen to contact us? Why don't they land on the White House lawn and make themselves known? And say, Maybe. take me to your leader, of course. That's well, the common joke in the that's States. That's right. The only problem is there is no leader to be taken to. Nobody that's speaks for the point. planet. There's nobody who speaks for planet Earth. That's true. Certainly not the President of the United States does not speak for four and a half billion That's right. He's got enough trouble yes, talking for, for his own staff lately. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> But yeah, I, I think maybe the prerequisite for their communication with us is that we, we talk to them first. We ask them to talk to us as a planet. Now, there's been almost no thinking along that line. I was at a television station of all places and uh, had to wait between interviews. I was doing like three different things there and there was time in between. I was introduced to the station manager. We talked and he said, gee, you ought to talk to Major Jesse Marcel. He handled one of these saucers that crashed. Well, that was kind of a, a good lead. Uh, he gave me the town that he, Jesse lived in, and I contacted Jesse, and he told me a very interesting story. Sounded very straight. He couldn't remember the exact date, said it was in all the papers. I got that story and passed it on to Bill, and uh, he found the newspaper articles, and we checked a whole bunch of papers. It, Jesse was right on, and everything he had said. So he gave us an independent check on him. That was one part of the story, and that dealt with pieces of material that were found that apparently had exploded from a vehicle going by in the sky, what, 70 miles outside of Roswell, I guess, <laughs> out in the boonies. Outside of Roswell. Yeah, well, New Mexico is a, is a very big place. It's the 34th largest state, maybe the fifth, uh, and it doesn't have a high population. It's got a lot of mountains and desert. At that time, it had fewer than a million people in an area of, oh, 125,000 square miles, something like that. And they were mostly in the cities, and it was an area where there was an enormous amount of classified government research going on. That's the place where the atom bomb was first tested. It's where it was developed. It's where all the early rockets after the Second World War were fired, captured German rockets at White Sands Proving Ground. It was where the secret city, Los Alamos, was. There were a number of other Air Force bases. You could hide an army <laughs> there. And yet a whole host of people who were very patriotic after the war when they found out that the atom bomb was developed there, then they knew that there was a reason for the security that they'd run into. He was the intelligence officer of the only atomic bombing group in the world, the 509th bomb group. They found all this stuff covering the ground three quarters of a mile long, maybe a quarter mile wide, kind of V-shaped. And uh, they filled up a truck with it and half a car with it, brought some back, brought it that back, leaving plenty there, which was later vacuumed up by military people, as the local people said. But that was only part of the story. The other part is even more fascinating because it involved apparently the crash of the rest of the vehicle, what, 100 miles or so west of there. Mm -hmm. And bodies were found on board that, and the military carted that off. Any uh, description of the bodies? Oh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> very quickly, uh, between three and a half and four and a half th uh, feet high, uh, 85 to 95 pounds, uh, essentially hairless, a head larger in proportion to the body than a human head would be, but not larger than a human head, uh, widely spaced and deeply set eyes, no apparent protrusions or ears or nose, uh, nares and ear, ear canals present, but not the protrusions that a human would have. Um, very small teeth and unusually um, uh, four fingers instead of five and working in quite a different way. They seem to be articulated in the sense that uh, they would work something like this with, with this finger up here being sort of folding over these two being less useful but these three being the graspers. The hairs on the back of my neck were standing on end. What I was hearing couldn't possibly be true. But here, these two university-educated men, one a scientist, the other an author, believed every word they were saying. We should stress here now that there are more than 3,000 reports in one computerized file of observations of alien beings associated with flying saucers. That covers dozens of countries, lots of incidents over at least a 35-year period. And there are no reports of creatures with three arms or three eyes or three legs or, you know, the, the science fiction kind of stuff. And I think we have to take that into account that one must be careful how one breaks the news, so to speak. In the United States, for example, um, the Mormon religion has long accepted the notion of beings on other worlds. Uh, certainly the Buddhist do, the Hindu religion does. There are some fundamentalist Christian sects in the United States, however who are not inclined in that direction at all. I mean, this is it. And it would be very upset and disturbed. 
you can't just lay something as significant as flying saucers, which change our whole position in the universe, after all. It's like Copernicus. He took man out of the center of the universe, moved it one step over from the Earth to the sun. The book was banned for 300 years uh, because it was disturbing to the high priesthood of the time. So the next generation is certainly going to know you know, have a different perspective. But you've got to be careful about that. You can't destroy what people have thought and grown up with without replacing with something that's, that's solid and concrete. Max Planck, a German physicist, once said that new ideas come to be accepted, not because their opponents come to believe in them, but because their opponents die and a new generation grows up that's accustomed to them. And so it may well be that you need to have this background space travel, man is not alone. These are commonly accepted notions now. They certainly weren't 30 years ago. If you go back to 1947, you talk space travel. You were considered pretty odd, pretty strange. That was science fiction. That was Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon. So there has been an enormous shift in attitude. And maybe the finishing touch for that is the announcement, some kind of announcement about flying saucers. In 1959, the United States government, the Air Force, and the Army contributed to the development of a flying disc. It was constructed by A.V. Rowe of Canada and was known as the Avro Car. In the most recent configuration, with the addition of the pneumatic control boot, the vehicle displayed stable flight characteristics at a height of 3 feet and at speeds up to 30 knots. The wind tunnel test data showed, however, that the focusing ring control, though it had been developed for satisfactory hovering, was not good enough for forward flight, and that fairly extensive modifications were required to add an improved forward flight control system. Testing was therefore discontinued until the two vehicles could be modified in readiness for further wind tunnel and flight test programs. But those modifications were never made. The program was officially abandoned in 1962. But in effect, the Avro car proved that a vehicle of this kind could in fact fly. Does it seem pure coincidence then that 1962 was also the year that J. Frank King applied for patent on the magneto-hydrodynamic system of propulsion? King had told me of Agnew Bonson's visions of the future, which he had expressed in his book, The Stars Are Too High. He wrote it because he was interested in a number of things that this would put before the public. One is the tremendous physical and psychological power that a country would have if it alone controlled a machine like a flying saucer. Uh, he was interested in politics, but never a politician. He was more scientific than he was politically inclined, but he was highly interested in, well, his, his uh, Council of Eight that he sort of coined. The Council of Eight is a group made up of a group of eight people drawn from, from the world. And these are influential people, not politically inclined people. They could be scientists, they could be other people. And he was working toward the end of his lifetime trying to really establish that. To start off with, it was, it was a thought that he put in his book. His book included the Flying Saucer, the Council of Eight, uh, the devastation that a machine like this could cause, or the possibility that it, maybe it could draw people together if all of a sudden you have a weapon that's so powerful that uh, there's no countering it, then no one should own it. And maybe the weapon should be destroyed and everybody recognize that, um, you know, we, we just shouldn't do that. It parallels uh, atomic energy right now. But the, the saucer would have been that type of device. And so I think he had philosophical reasons for wanting to write a book like this. There were a lot of things that he wanted to bring out and did bring out in his book, The Stars Are Too High. Rear Admiral LaRock is the spokesman for the Center for Defense Information in Washington, D.C. Uh, we stand for a strong national defense. Uh, we think war is a pretty stupid way to settle international difficulties. And nuclear war, we think, is insane. The worst single problem facing planet Earth today is overpopulation. The only effective method demonstrated to date that can control this overpopulation is war. A 
of the species, if you like, but a method by which millions of human beings can be dispensed with. Well, I think that this administration believes that they can fight and win a nuclear war. And they're trying to convince the American public if they'll just spend a few more billions of dollars and buy a few more thousand nuclear weapons, that we can somehow fight and win a nuclear war, that we can somehow defend ourselves against a Soviet attack. Uh, I believe they're wrong on both counts. Do you have an alternate? Plan? Yes, indeed. I, I think, first of all, that we have to recognize that we and the Soviets and the other countries of the world have to live together on this planet, that we can't push each other around, that neither side can start and uh, expect to win a nuclear war. As a nuclear physicist, I'm very much concerned about the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Six countries have them now, and the next, by the end of the century, surely there'll be another 10 countries. All it takes is one idiot to get the ball rolling, if you will, to use a nuclear weapon. Somebody else will respond, three, four, or five will respond, and we have literally a hell on Earth. Now. It seems to me that the best hope to avoid that is for us all to begin to think of ourselves as Earthlings. When the United States first began to deploy reconnaissance satellites back in the early 1960s, the Russians protested loudly. There was even the threat that they might try to shoot them down. But by 1963, the Russians had developed their own reconnaissance satellites, and they were delighted to have them. In other words, the Russian military, it would be only natural, don't want to take our Defense Department statement for how many missiles we have. They want to count them with their own eyes, with their own reconnaissance satellites. We know, for example, today exactly how many nuclear weapons the Soviets have, how many missiles, how many submarines, how many aircraft. We know their system e exactly. They know exactly what we have. We know they have 64 anti-ballistic missiles around Moscow. They have a, a 1,398 ICBMs. Not one more, not one less. We can see from our satellites a golf ball on a green in the Soviet Union. They have one golf course in the Soviet Union. We literally can see a golf ball on a green. We see people's faces. We watch them build their ships. We see their daily life, just as they observe the people in the United States and our military. So the two great superpowers of Earth can identify a golf ball on a green from outer space. But officially, they can't identify a UFO, even though hundreds of sightings are made each year. I am convinced that both the United States and the Soviet Union have flying saucer technology, whatever the propulsion system may be. Whether it is based on technology devised by Nikola Tesla 80 years ago and perfected by brilliant scientists such as Townsend Brown and the like, or copied from a crashed extraterrestrial craft. Nuclear war equipment and machinery are only a smokescreen, for without the industry and employment that is created by war machinery, the world economy would collapse. There are no secrets between the great powers. They know the truth. Now, in light of the documentary you've just seen, you may find yourself at some future date in a dilemma. And that dilemma may come about on that day that the world goes into possibly World War III or economic chaos, whatever. On that same day, you may find that the world is magically saved or appears to be saved by the arrival of super technology, such as we've seen that the Earth has had in its back rooms for 30 years. Your dilemma will be to determine whether these so-called humanoids from space or time, whatever, are real or are they imposters. Silence, foolish mortals, your fate is sealed. What is the standing order of your imperious leader? Destroy. 
After seeing the Battlestar Galactica set here at the Universal Studios tour, I'm even more impressed with the illusions that man and his technology can produce today. Remember, things are not always as they seem.